Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Brain Food Show. Here this week, as always, it's me, one of your co-hosts, Simon, and as ever, Davin. How you doing? Good. How are you? How's the baby? Good. Yeah. 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 Um, first, what, like seven weeks old now, nice. so still loud still alive. at points. That's the key um, thing, you know? Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it does surprise me, like, oh, babies can die when they're young. Yeah. So you, you have all these things like a breathing monitor and, I don't know, I'll take her out for a walk in the pram or whatever. Yeah. And it'd be like, you're still alive? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> totally. I don't know. I've got quite good at the old give it a little blow on the face. Yeah. And uh, see they also- <laughs> does a little scrunch the face. And you're like, good. Yeah. They also have, uh, I used, that worked really good. I can't even remember the name of it. Um, but it's like a little heart monitor thing you put on their feet and it gives you their oxygen and, oh. uh, and heart rate. And it's like connected to your phone, like with a, like an alarm and everything. So you can just like, look, oh yeah, oxygen level good, heart, heart rate good. It's kind of cool. Oh, that's pretty clever. You know, I didn't end up getting that yeah. because I was like, well, I've got the breathing monitor in the bed. Do I really need that? Yeah. And so I didn't get it. Yeah. But actually, that'd be quite clever because then you don't have to do the whole blowing on the face thing. It's just kind of fun, too, just to look. You can see their heart rate like at any time and just pull out your phone or whatever. Yeah, it worked pretty well. Okay, cool. I'm going to add it to my list to buy one of those. I think it was relatively cheap. Yeah, so. yeah, it was. Uh, okay. Oh, Alette. That's cool. what it was. Al Alette or something like that. Yeah. Al Alette. Yeah. It sounds like a Middle Eastern building. Yeah, yeah um cool uh like the burj al khalifa or whatever it's called the ally the burj ally yeah. <laughs> i could be being quite offensive is this offensive <laughs> am i being racially insensitive again um so yeah no that's all going well i i have in my notes here briefly mentioned the contest so yeah. shall i do yes, that we so should. then we can uh, give the people what they want yes okay uh yeah this is the brain food show obviously if wherever you're listening to this if you're watching it on youtube well step number one why not listen to it as a podcast for your own convenience? It's way better there. And then once you're doing that, sorry. It's way better on the podcast form. Way better. You don't have to look at our stupid faces. Mm-hmm. Uh, and once you've started listening to it as a podcast, go leave it a review on iTunes or uh, Stitcher or uh, any of these other podcast apps that I don't use. And, you know, let us know how we're doing. And if you do... We are, when it gets to a thousand reviews on the American iTunes store, we're going to go through and pick someone at random, but not just from that store, from all of the iTunes stores. Wait, so if you're like British and you're thinking, well, that's a bit unfair, Simon. That sounds a bit racist to me. Um, You're discriminating against British people. I'll be like, well, that's okay, because you're included too. You can uh, leave your review. We'll compile them all. We'll choose someone at random to win a thousand dollar Amazon gift card. If that's not a good reason to go and leave us a review, doesn't have to be a good review, Although it would be uncomfortable, like we always say. <laughs> if it's like, congratulations, one star winner. <laughs> well, <laughs> who hates our podcast. we would never actually have to give it to them, though, because if you think about it, the one star person's not going to keep listening. So when we announce the contest winner, they're never going to hear it. And so at a certain point, we'll just be like, well, you know, the one star person never responded. So best, now yeah. we're going to pick someone else. <laughs> you know, We're going to get people now just hate listening to our podcast on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I hate it, but I have to listen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, should we move into some actual facts yep. and stuff? I mean, the facts about baby heart monitors and stuff was great. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, no, handy. I mean, like, our usual I really stuff. liked that uh, that little device. But yes. Yeah. So, quick fact today. We're gonna look. How's that for a quick fact? Yeah. We're gonna look at the the woman, the first woman to ever cast a political vote in Chicago. One Kitty Smith, and what is interesting about her, besides, of course, she was the first, was that she also cast her vote with her feet. And so why her feet? So she actually lost both her arms as a child, and she basically just um, burned them really badly on a kitchen stove. And you think, how could you burn your arms so badly that they have to amputate them? Um, And so for a long time, it was rumored and still kind of rumored that her father did it. Like he just like held her arms against the hot stove uh, because he was alcoholic and extremely abusive. But, uh, and, and the severe, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. yeah, the severity of her burns was kind of, cause mostly, I mean, if you're going to fall against the stove or touch it with your arm, you're just going to jerk away. So why didn't she do that? Why was she just like seemingly holding them against there to burn them so badly they need amputated? But Kitty herself denied this, uh, when she was an adult, she said in her own words. 
My father was a drinking man, and he was in the habit of sending his children to a neighboring saloon for liquor, though I was sent more often than any of the others. I remember tasting of the liquor I carried and thinking it was always beer. In November 1891, and on the afternoon of Thanksgiving Day, my father and I were alone in the house. My brother's, uh being at play out of doors and in going about the house i found a bottle filled with what i afterwards knew must have been whiskey being but a child i picked up the bottle and drank freely from it its effect was almost immediate and i grew weak and stupefied my father <laughs> i love that word stupefied <laughs> it's what i'm gonna start when i get drunk from now on i'm just gonna say that i'm in a state of stupefaction <laughs> rather than you know yeah. Yeah. it's like how much did you have to drink uh i'm not drunk i'm stupefied <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. My father was <laughs> in an adjoining room and called me to go and put some wood on the kitchen fire, and I called back that I was sick and could not go, but he insisted, and I obeyed. I had taken the lid from the stove when, from the combined effect of the heat and the liquor, my whole being gave way, and I sank onto the open stove unconscious. I must have lain there some time, for the physicians and surgeons said the bones of my hands and arms were amputated three inches from the shoulders. Good lord. Yeah. That's no joke. Yeah. I was I've never been that drunk. I shouldn't make fun. <laughs> I was burned on the neck and on the chest, but those burns were not serious. We lived at this time at 548 Park Avenue and neighbors claimed that my father was also intoxicated and that he held me on the stove until my arms were burned and then and that they heard my screaming. The Humane Society of Illinois took the matter and had my father placed under arrest. After a trial in a justice court, he was held to the grand jury, and on the final trial in the spring of 1892, he was acquitted for lack of evidence. Yes. That is, dude, when you started this off and you were like, why did she cast her vote with her feet? Yeah. Kind of almost upbeat. I'm like, oh, it's going to be entertaining. And then it turns out to be the most horrific thing ever. No, it is. And it's really sad because there's this picture of her as a little girl that she has her arms. And I didn't include this in this, but like she she's like talking about this picture. It's like one of her most cherished possessions because it's the only picture, the only like picture she has of her with her arms. And she just like really loves you know seeing her little arms there and she didn't you know didn't have them later so after this got worse for her because after she loses her arms very shortly after her father just waved it all rights to her and gave her up to the children's home mm. society of illinois and so it's not where they hear her mother had already died when she was nine years old so it just really sucked to live back then um as well um i get it well we're doing one uh, pretty soon on the has a night a medieval night ever actually rescued a damsel in distress and if you want to see like a script that just show so proves how awful like if you're a woman living in any time in history like right now this is the only time you would want to live and maybe like in the future obviously but like it is so you're gonna read this script soon and you're just gonna be like wow yep um i don't want to really spoil it here but people should go and watch that one okay because it's really good and it's super interesting um but yeah Anyways, so yeah, she's her her mother dies when she's nine. She's given up to the orphanage, and then she's taken and kind of you know goes to a variety of homes over time. And she eventually gets educated and learns to write with her feet and do so she can sew with her feet and do a lot of other do like crafts and stuff, um, which is how she would later support herself. I'm um, doing this, and if you go look, this just the idea of getting so dexterous with your feet, yeah, is quite like. I can barely even, I don't think I can move my toes individually. No, and if you go look at her handwriting, it's really good. Like, even for cursive, it's like, you know, cursive Oz often is... I believe that's foot writing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Put a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <it's... laughs> yeah, if you go look. God, it's not appropriate. If you go... I don't know what's wrong with me today. I'm super inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. If you go look, it's really good. There's lots of examples of her writing. And this is how she supported herself. She sold drawings. She did art and uh, embroidery and write, wrote cards and stuff. Uh, so when she was an adult, that's how she supported herself. And then so she goes, uh, eventually becomes the first woman to vote in Chicago, Illinois in 1913. And you might think at this point, I mean, you might not, but people who are more familiar with U.S. history. No, I definitely won't. Yeah, <laughs> would, would think, wait a minute, the 19th Amendment would, allowing women to vote didn't happen until 1920. So how did she vote in 1913? That's, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. The 19th Amendment, David. Yeah. And so... It's exactly, you know, it turns, just after the 18th yeah. and before the 20th. It turns out in, in Chicago, women actually had the vo right to vote in by, by 1913 <laughs> and later. And this was uh, Gracie Wilbert Trout and a bunch of others uh, kind of pushed for this and eventually got... Illinois to agree on June 26, 1913, women were allowed to vote in not just the local elections, but they could actually vote in the U.S. presidential elections, um, the wider. And so, yeah, so this this is how she did it. And she led the way over a quarter of a million women in 1913 voted. And she was the first with her feet. You know, so, yeah. 
Oh, nice ending, yeah. at least. Yeah, sort sort of. I mean, she still doesn't you know, have her arms. And... It started off her uh, being horribly burned. So... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. A serious question. Yes. I think I've been saying Illinois wrong forever. Yeah, Illinois. Is it? Illin- it's not Illinois. It's it. You, it's not a silent S. <laughs> no, it is Illinois. Did I say Illinois? Illinois. Yeah. Wait. Okay. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> wait. Is it Illinois or Illinois? Illinois. Okay. Cool. No, I've been saying. Okay. I, I swear you said Illinois. <laughs> I might have. And then I'm like, oh my god. No wonder everyone has a go at me for pronunciation. <laughs> because I've been saying that wrong forever. Yeah. <laughs> well. You know, it's sort of a meme on the channel, so it works yeah, it out. It is. Uh, speaking of skills, <laughs> or lack of skills, maybe Skillshare's got a course on pronunciations yeah. that I, I wouldn't take because I don't care. Yeah. Uh, but, the, you know, I'd definitely take one of their other courses, mm-hmm. learn one of the other skills that you can learn on there. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives. That would be you. That would be me. That would be millions of other people. And they all come together on this beautiful platform that is known as Skillshare to improve their skills together, to become, well, if not more creative. I don't know, can you learn to become more creative? I don't know, maybe you can. Maybe there's a course on Skillshare about learning how to become more creative. I totally I think, I I up, totally so I think you can learn to become more creative. It's just practice like anything, right? Yeah. Like uh, like oh, so, uh, yeah. James Altucher's got a big spiel on that where he does, where he does the... Um, the practice like every morning or whatever whenever he does it where he'll just write like ideas just like and it doesn't matter the craziest stupid ideas but then when you just do that all the time you just start coming up with actual good ones sometimes you know and you get better at coming up with good ideas and not just all stupid and yeah i totally think uh with all that yeah okay well there i am being sarcastic but you can probably <laughs> learn about creativity yeah. on skillshare yeah. i'm betting it's on there i'd look it up right now if it wasn't so disruptive to the ad yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, there's lots of stuff that you can try on there. Whether you're a beginner, a pro, a dabbler, a master. These were the four ones they said for me, you know, it's in the it's in the little ad copy we get. And I'm like, couldn't we just say everybody would learn something from Skillshare? I believe if you're a beginner to a master, that's got to be everyone in between, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so I think that, you know what that means? Skillshare is a fit for everyone listening. Mm-hmm. And that means everyone listening could potentially support this show and go and sign up. Uh, you want to hear about something I've done on their platform? You did something? I did. Yeah. What was um, it? You know, emails. Well, emails, right? Yeah. Like, I had... My kind of email management system was... I just used Gmail. Yeah, naturally. <laughs> I feel like 99% of the population. Yeah. And it just comes in, and I try and clear them out. Mm-hmm. And then, I don't yeah. know if you get this, but there'll be like 70 emails at the bottom of the box, which is all stuff that you don't really want to reply to. Yeah. And have been putting off for months. Yeah. And you're like, uh, yeah, I don't really, I just know. Yeah. And it kind of, I don't know, it makes me feel bad about myself. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, honestly, I did it because Skillshare were doing a read uh, on this channel. And they were like, I had to choose something from their like specific like selection of courses. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, okay, I feel pretty bad about this constantly. So I'm at least going <laughs> to try this one out. And uh, yeah, it's pretty good. So now I have this system, like stuff comes in and the stuff that you don't want to deal with, you can just file away somewhere else. But then it's like, you can come back to it at specific times and deal with it. Mm -hmm. So rather than feeling guilty about it all the time, you just have this like one granted unpleasant moment (laughs) of going through and actually dealing with it, which, you know, while not great because it's, you still have to do your emails. It makes, it's just a, yeah, just building a system around this makes me feel better about myself. So that's my course recommendation. Who's it by? Alexandra Samuel. That would probably be good because uh, I'd recommend checking it out. Yeah, the other day I spent an entire day going through over a thousand emails because I had been putting it off uh, for a little bit. (laughs) I thought 70 was bad. (laughs) I got it down to. Well, you should take this course as well. Yeah, yeah. I got it down to like 10 of those ones that I just really didn't want to respond to at that moment because they were too long, you know, but yeah. But that's only 10 you did 990 yeah, that's pretty good yeah. so i think what, what we've established with it in the last couple of minutes is skillshare is for everyone there are millions of people already using it it will solve all of your life's <laughs> problems not a guarantee and uh especially email problems or learn some skills become more creative i bet that's on there yes and you can get two months of skillshare premium for free just go to skillshare.com forward slash brain food Two months of premium for free. Skillshare.com forward slash brain food. It's for you because it's for everyone. Let's carry on. All right. So 
what are we talking about today? And today we are talking about one of the more, I think, uh, interesting and awesome women in, I don't know, not just American history. She's just a pretty, uh, pretty unique, um, interesting woman well ahead of her time. Many of the things she advocated for would still be a little bit ahead of their time for the 21st century, but not as much. But she lived in the 19th century. And so this woman was the first woman ever to run for the office of the presidency in the U.S., um, and she did this all the way back in April 2nd, 1871 is when she announced her candidacy. And the woman was named Victoria Claflin Woodhull, um, which I'm probably going to keep saying Woodhill because every, when I was uh, going through this, I just kept saying that. Uh, but Woodhull. And so Woodhull begins, begins her life as Victoria Claflin in 1838. She's the seventh of 10 children born to Roxana and Reuben Claflin. And so she was, despite her later success, you know, she ran for president. She, she was also the first female stockbroker on Wall Street, and she was super successful at that. Um, and she actually had only three years of formal education occurring from when she was 8 to 11. She might have received more, but her father ended up burning down his grist mill to, in order to collect on an insurance policy that he had recently taken out. What's a grist mill? I don't know. I was actually going to look that up, and I totally forgot. Uh, grist It's probably really boring, but I kind of imagine it as like something, you know, that transforms like, you know, the gristle from chicken bones into like chicken McNuggets. Or yeah, uh, it's actually a corn mill or flour mill. So, yeah. yeah so, it's but. Slightly boring in comparison. It is. Uh, but. Because, you know, compared chicken McNuggets compared to bread. So, and it turns out this, this insurance fraud that he was going for here was kind of par for the course for him because mm. he was a professional con artist and snake oil salesman was her father. And so this was actually the last straw. Like he had done a lot of conning people and, and doing stuff like this all the time. And so the town residents literally just ran him out of town, like in the literal sense, like literally <laughs> chased him out of town. And uh, as for his wife and children who were still around. I feel like it's, it's just not something that happens anymore. Right? No, like the ra- ra- <laughs> no one's like, oh, you've been naughty. We're going to run you out of town. Yeah, <laughs> run him out on a rail or whatever. Like, but I'll just come back. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but his wife and children were still there initially, and they didn't have any money to leave, basically, was the problem. So the townspeople hated the Claughlins so much that they raised money for the family just so they would go somewhere, like anywhere, just leave, like the rest of the family. Um, so Victoria, this was kind of her, her childhood. And so her. we're also going to talk a little bit about her younger sister, Tennessee Claughlin. So she was also kind of equally as notable as Victoria. Um, but So they, they decide mm-hmm. to start support, helping support the family as magnetic healers, clairvoyants, and fortune tellers. Oh, and this was at the, you know, this was, she was quite young young early teens when she started this um so unfortunately for her though at the age of 14 when dr canning woodhull uh, came into her life so this was uh, two months after her 15th birthday her parents went on, went ahead and married her off to the 20 year old doctor in november of 1853 28 year old yeah and she was 15 and this a lot of people think this is dude yeah a lot of people think this was common and it really wasn't common like really in most of history of the western world no yeah we've We've covered this in enough videos for me to... I think it's come up like, I don't know, two or three times yeah. whenever this comes yeah. up. And I, I didn't know this until we were doing videos. And I'm like, oh, okay, so it is totally No, weird. They, they would have considered it totally weird back then. The thing with this, though, she was a poor, you know, poor girl with little prospects. And so a 28-year-old doctor, you know, <laughs> uh, that that's, that's where a lot of the exceptions... Like, certainly the royals had their exceptions just for other reasons. But in this case, they the, the exception was if you were a young girl with no prospects and then some wealthy older guy is like, yeah, I'll marry you. Then that's where the parents would... Yeah, dude, I'm not saying, like, I, the whole thing's weird. Yeah. But it's more the twenty-eight-year-old guy is the real weird. Yeah, no, no, totally. And so, <laughs> yeah. So that and just for reference, for people to reference at that time, it, at this time in the nineteenth century, twenty-three years old was the average age for a woman to get married. So that was actually that was actually you know not that far off today. Uh, and so this was also eight years off the mark for her. Um, and it turns out the the since the eighteenth century, the lowest average age for marriage for a woman was actually accomplished by the baby boomer generation in America at around twenty years old. Uh, was the lowest and that not coincidentally probably is the same group that had the highest divorce ra- divorce rates as well um so and they've been in decline ever since the um the peak of the divorce rates in the 1980s so um yeah and so today also for reference the, the average for a woman is 26 year old for first marriage and 28 for men but going back to victoria in any event so she's a young teen woman she gets married off to this doctor um, and, uh, and basically just cause you know, there's a bright future there. He's a doctor, right? Um, oh, I did want to do a quick aside. 
He's a doctor and a bit of a PA. Yeah, and, and uh, I did want to do a quick aside because uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, yeah. Edgar Allan Poe was a bit of a Peter. Yeah, as well, 20, 26 years old. Uh, he married his 13-year-old cousin, Virginia, which, I mean, it's so creepy. But in that case, in this case at least, we'll, we'll get to Victoria in a bit. Like, that case didn't work out for her. But in this case, it actually, they're like a really happy couple until Virginia's death at the age of 24 of tuberculosis because, you know, 19th century. So, yeah, she even, like, Virginia slept with a picture of Poe under her pillow was the thing that she always did. And she wrote I, this, because uh, Valentine's, Valentine's Day is coming up, so I put in the acrostic Valentine's Day poem she wrote for uh, Edgar Allan Poe a year before her death. Um, and the poem is... Ever with thee I wish to roam, dearest, my life is thine. Give me a cottage for my home and a rich old cypress vine, removed from the world with its sin and care and the tattling of many tongues. Love alone shall guide us when we are there. Love shall heal my weakened lungs. And oh, the tranquil hours we'll spend, never wishing that others may see. Perfect ease we'll enjoy, without thinking to lend ourselves to the world and its glee. Ever peaceful and blissful we'll be. And the, I mean, that's actually not a bad poem, but it's also a little more clever for people who can see it, is if you look at the first letter of every line, it ends up uh, spelling Edgar Allan Poe. So, in any event, yeah, yeah going back. To is this, so the... Just a quick question. Yeah. The acrostic part of this is the Edgar Allan yes, Poe yes. bit, like down the left, yeah, right? Yeah. Because and but it also rhymes. It's yeah. I I quite enjoy this. No, poem. it's a it's but a, as a kid, yeah. As I was just gonna say, as a kid, you know, when you're asked to write a poem in English class and you can choose what type of poem, I'd always choose the acrostic type of poem because then you don't have to make it rhyme. <laughs> you can just choose any word and just start the sentence with that letter and you're done. Yeah. Whereas you know, actually making poems that rhyme is a bit more complicated. Yeah. Well, her husband was Edgar Allan Poe, you know, so it probably helped, and she was. <laughs> 23 and dying at the time so you know laying in bed ridden so she probably had a good amount of time to just you know work on it right? i'm not saying i couldn't make it rhyme i'm just saying <laughs> just eat. it's less easy yeah so going back to victoria though her marriage did not work out well at all her new husband was an alcoholic and a womanizer and so um yeah she he basically left her and she eventually had two kids a daughter and uh, and a son with this guy and left her like kind of in squalor and just saved most of the financial fruits of his labor as a doctor for him and his many mistresses, uh, you know, wasn't home a lot and just out uh, cavorting. So eventually, so this was a time of course, where divorcing a man for any reason was super scandalous and left the woman in question without a good way to support herself or her children. But she, mm -hmm. this was kind of one of the first bucking the trends, major societal trends. And she divorced Dr. Canning after 11 years of marriage and uh, yeah, and interesting though, despite the fact that she uh, despised her ex-husband, for whatever reason, she chose to keep his surname for uh, even she got married two more times and still kept the Woodhull surname the whole time for who she she never said why or not doc documented why. So the first of her additional marriages was two years after her divorce. She married Civil War veteran Colonel James Blood of Missouri, which uh, take that name. <laughs> right, this is the great. This is James Bond. <laughs> yeah, level, right? level name. Like yeah. We've got to defeat Colonel Blood. And it's totally way cooler than Woodhull. Uh, she should have totally gone with that one. Yeah. But uh, so he actually, Blood, was super encouraging of his wife's free thinking and independence. And so help her fight for equal rights, regardless of sex or race and all the other things we're going to get to that she did. And they also moved to New York City uh, with uh, her sister, Tennessee. They all kind of went there in 1868. Dude, it's weird. Dr. Woodhull's the bad guy. Colonel Blood is the bad right. guy. <laughs> I know, right? Totally. Uh, and yeah, he seemed like a, a good guy. But uh, so yeah, so New York, <laughs> it worked out really well for Victoria and Tennessee. So they're still, you know, doing the thing where they're, you know, fortune tellers and all this and and talking to the dead, working as mediums and stuff and, and you know, peddling various snake oil type things like their father had done before. But it was during this that they end up meeting Cornelius Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt, the extremely wealthy Cornelius Vanderbilt and so he was super interested mm -hmm. in spiritualism and wanted to connect with his dead mother and so he was using the the girls for for this purpose and uh, he also hated doctors so he really liked their method of healing and whatnot as well so they became quite close and it's also thought that Tennessee actually became a serious love interest of Vanderbilt's um, but he was super in, uh, uh, impressed with the with the two ladies and so he actually invested heavily in the sisters in their founding of Woodhill Claflin and Company Bankers and Brokers which was a stock brokerage firm and opened in early 1870 and it made them the first female stockbrokers on Wall Street um, 
This is so strange, though. Like, what do you do? Uh, I'm really impressed with your magnetic healing. Yeah. We'd like to start a stock brokerage. Yeah, you. and your and your complete like almost con artist nature. But I mean, maybe that was it. It was like con artist Wall Street's for you. <laughs> you know, like maybe that was it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the business actually thrived. Like, he's like, almost you know, what emails would really make a killing. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, taking other people's money yeah. on Wall Street. So that their their firm actually became super super successful, and they got nicknamed the Queens of Finance in the press. Uh, at which at the, around the same time, Hetty Green came along, investing her own fortune uh, rather than working as a stockbroker. And her she she got the nickname the Witch of Wall Street. So they they were doing, uh, you know, a little better in the public eye. Did we do a podcast about her? Uh, or a video, uh, video. Or yeah, she's super interesting. Um, if this one wasn't so long already, I probably would have uh, put in some interesting stuff around her because she was quite a colorful woman. I don't think we did a podcast. I think we might have mm. mentioned her son or something at some point. It might have been a video. I can never remember. It's just familiar to me, and I can't imagine a reason yeah. why it would be. Other yeah, than we've t- we finally reached the point. I wonder when it would happen when I when I can no longer like before. Like I've got like five thousand articles. We got like fifteen hundred videos. We got. Like 60 or 70 podcasts and i used to be able to to keep it in my head like what we've done where and now it's gone like i come across stuff all the time and i'm like have we done that on youtube yet or like you know the podcast i i had one the other day i've I've got a, a new channel called business blaze yeah. which subscribe if you're listening yeah. and i talk about something it's like i think i know this i'm not really sure and then someone's like simon of course you know about it. You did an entire video about it like two years ago. Oh, yeah, I guess I do. You're like, that was 3,000 videos ago. So, you know, you can't keep yeah. it all. <laughs> it is a bit like, I can't possibly keep up. Yeah, I've, I at least have not lost. I can always tell when I have covered something somewhere. You know, I just no longer sir where. Yeah, it's, but it's that vague recollection, yeah. right? It's like, ah, yeah, this is fam- like too familiar to have just been something I read on the internet. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. So yeah, they're they're were quite successful in their little stock brokerage thing almost right away. So they were able to actually use funds from that to found then the Woodhull and Claughlin's weekly newspaper, uh, the two sisters. So they focused a lot on like a lot of controversial ideas, like promoting sex education, which was a big no-no at their time. Ooh, yeah, on, yeah. yeah. Uh, publishing also the the. The only the only option is abstinence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or yeah. Wait, isn't that something you still struggle with today? I swear I read about this on like Reddit or whatever, where yeah. it's, you know, some American school has banned education. <laughs> you know, you can't mention condoms. Yeah. It's like, that seems like a terrible idea. Well, and at the time in the 19th century, it wouldn't even be the option is not abstinence because you have to do whatever your husband uh, wants, basically, or as we'll get into here, this was kind of a part of her platform. So she also committed the triple taboo of the day of speaking out not just in support of equal rights and fair treatment regardless of race, but also regardless of sexual orientation or sex. Um, so this was this did not make her, her publication popular um, in, in a lot of circle, circles. So a bit controversial. Oh, and she also advocated for the legalization of prostitution, which, which at the time there were over 10,000 of them in New York. Uh, and so it was something that like, in 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 her view she points out is so society completely rejects it as a thing like legally the the women are shunned and all that and mm-hmm. yet almost the entirety of the male half of the population is frequenting their services uh while at the same time <laughs> passing laws making it illegal um so yeah yes well hypocrisy is not a new she thing. was if you really I, I included uh some of her writings here and some of the transcripts of her speeches but like if people want to go be entertained go read woodhill's speeches and writings because she's hilarious and i think probably for having a con artist of a father probably helped you know like growing up in that you know she's she was a very talented speaker mm-hmm. and uh and and um debater basically um so yeah, so she also used the weekly eventually to further her own candidacy for the office of the presidency, but she didn't actually announce it there. She announced it in the New York Herald on April 2nd, 1871, as mentioned. In her letter to the publication, she wrote, I claim the right to speak for the unenfranchised women of the country and denounce myself as a candidate for the presidency. Yeah, and so it is noteworthy here. She wasn't actually old enough to be the president. Uh, she was uh, a little bit about six months off, like if she were to actually be have been elected. Oh. She would have been... Wait, how old do you have to uh, be? 35 is when you, you have to be. But, uh, so some people say... 
Is that true even today? Yeah. Yeah, and but there are there huh. there are like laws like this where so like for instance Henry Clay, which uh, was a famous U.S. politician, and so he he became a senator before the age of thirty, which was also thirty was the cutoff for senators, but nobody seemed to care. So there's there's precedent. So like even had she been elected, like of of them just ignoring it. So even in Henry Clay's case, like his opponents, particularly when it looked like he was going to win, could have just been like, nope. He's not old enough, so we win now. You know, like they could have done that, and they, they, nobody did. Nobody bothered because um, you know he won the election. So there is precedent for for that being wow. ignored, not in the presidency, but um, but yeah, had she, so, dude, I'm I'm like 32. I would feel, I don't know, slightly nervous about someone my age running yeah. a country because I'd be like, I just don't feel like I've got enough life experience yet. I'll still be like, I don't know, but maybe I'm just not competent adult. <laughs> feels young it does to me i don't think we have such a restriction in the uk but i don't think anyone without gray hair you know or old enough to have gray hair would really get elected yeah it'd probably be an interesting more interesting presidency because particularly younger people tend to be more impulsive about things you know a little bit than the than well in theory yeah in theory anyway not not everyone um but yeah, so Woodhill's presidential campaign platform, as you might have guessed from from the things we've talked about her so far, was she, women's suffrage. She was huge on that. She was also huge on shortening of the workday and work week, which for reference here, in the late eight, in 1890, so um, a couple decades later, so there was a survey done by the federal government in the U.S. that the average worker, it's gotta be working mad, tradesman, right? yeah, 90 to 100 hours per week, which if you do the math is over because they work six days a week. So if you do the math, that's over 16 hours a day was the average. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, this is, <laughs> I don't know, I make, we both work, I don't know, we both work, I assume, very long yeah, hours. Yeah. And well, it's like 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. right now, so, and I'm still working, so. <laughs> right, exactly. And, I mean, it's it's 10.21 a.m. here, so, it's, <laughs> no, it's a very normal time to be working. Like, if I wasn't working at 10.20 on a Monday morning, it'd be like, what's yeah, up? Yeah. Um, but people often, you know, comment or like send me emails. It's like, wow, you know, you must work really long weeks. How do you not burn out? And I'm like, dude, until like a hundred years ago, yeah, the hours I work, people would be like, whoa, you're pretty lazy. Exactly, because the factories. Speaking of Britain and stuff, the Factories Act of 1847 made it so that children that limited them to working only 60 hours a week as a, as a thing to just you know, which is still a long. Yeah, that's. 10 That's hour days week. six days a week for children six days a week children yeah so <laughs> yeah that, yeah we're like, like putting labels on jars like charles dickens yeah so uh, compared to workers back then we're, we're like featherweights um, so yeah the we became soft <laughs> exactly we're, and, they, and it's also what do i do i sit at a desk and talk to yeah. you in a microphone it's not really no hard, they were it? working in like the mines and like uh, if people go back and listen to like the charles dickens the sledgehammer for the poor man's child episode you know like yeah, yeah not not a good time so and it's you're having a miserable time and it's basically ruining you yeah it's like the worst i'm gonna get is like oh my wrists are a bit funny from typing yeah. too much or like my back's a little funny because my chair's not properly ergonomical and these guys are like oh he got blown up in a mine yeah. or he's got black lungs yeah it's not great and even then like your back or something you can just go to like a massage therapist or something and they'll fix you right up right or a chiropractor yeah. and whereas back then it's like no i have the black lung and i'm like dying at 25 <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it yeah um yeah no so what else uh, beyond this her campaign was also the most controversial part of her campaign and the one we're going to focus on because it's the most interesting is the her advocacy of free love which again this is like the mid 19th century so this is this was ahead of her time. So in her view, women at the time were just sexual slaves to men. And that's uh, and so just, you know, they were used basically for sex and procreation. And most men didn't have really much interest in women beyond that. Um, so and, and also her uh, women didn't really usually have a say in who they married, which um, so she stated in a speech on November 20th, 1871, entitled The Principles of Social Freedom. It is high time that your sisters and daughters should no longer be led to the altar like sheep to the shambles. The sexual relation must be rescued from this insidious form of slavery. And she goes on. 
To women, by nature, belongs the right of sexual determination. When the instinct is aroused in her, then and only then should commerce follow. When women, when women rise from sexual slavery to sexual freedom and the ownership and control of her sexual organs, and man is obliged to respect this freedom, then will this instinct become pure and holy, then will woman be raised from the iniquity and morbidness in which she now wallows for existence, and the intensity and glory of her creative functions be increased a hundredfold. Yeah, and so she also she thought mm. the key mechanism for making this happen would be basically not just voting power, which she was pushing for, but more important was the right to be able to earn a living and be properly educated uh, to basically allow them allow women to become you know independent um, for men and not depending on them. So she states. Women must rise from their positions as ministers to the passions of men to be their equals. Their entire system of education must be changed. They must, they must be trained, like men, to be permanent and independent individuals, and not their mere appendages or adjuncts, with them forming but one member of society. They must be the, company, the companions of men from choice, never from necessity. And I love... Just... Yeah. I would, I would add it. I, I believe it wasn't until, like, the early 1990s that... It was a crime in the UK. A, a man couldn't rape his wife. Really? And I think they changed that law in the 1990s, which sounds absurd, but I think that's true. Well, and, I'd need to look and it And you up. go back to even like the 1970s or 1980s, you watch like movies where, where it's like, especially sports ones and stuff like that. And the, uh, yeah, it's just like that. Like the amount of like sexism in them is, is you know, the, a lot of them don't age well, basically in such a short span, really. But um so I also, I liked, I, I included here, her foolproof plan to just make this happen even beyond voting. Like, forget voting, forget actual legal rights to anything. She equips uh, the foolproof plan to making all of this happen. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking up the marital <laughs> rape thing. Um... Gosh. Let a woman issue a declaration of independence sexually and absolutely refuse to cohabit with men until they are acknowledged as equals in everything and the victory would be won in a single week. <laughs> and on top of me not getting that quote on time, I also didn't find out the answer to the marital rape thing. So it's a lose lose situation on that one. Yeah. So this was, this was a, uh, you know, that, that it's a pretty good it plan. It would totally work. <laughs> um, so the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, is that okay? We're changing the law. <laughs> yeah, we're changing the law. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the core of her argument was <laughs> get it done by Friday, Parliament. <laughs> uh, so she she was actually the, the societal double standard was basically a big thing for her. The hypocrisy of it. So she lamented while men of the age were free to go and have mistresses and go to prostitutes and stuff as they pleased, and no one really seemed to care. Uh, a woman doing the same would be vilified and get in, you know, suffer actual harsh consequences, be shunned, and all that sort of business. And so, um, yeah, so she she herself was actually a monogamist, uh, interestingly, but she was just advocated. She basically her whole point of all this, not just with like sexual stuff, was just everyone should be able to do what people want and just live the lives they want to live, and no one should be able to judge them well, for that. That was kind of her her. Maybe even less than that. It shouldn't be that she doesn't seem to be saying people should be able to do whatever they want, just that women should be held to the same standards as men. Yeah, well, that right. No, because she's not saying you should. We would, I, you know, polyamory should be a thing. She's just saying, look, if men could do it, they either shouldn't or we should be able to as well. Yeah, but but it was like her thing is like if you're not hurting anyone, why can't you just do like if you're a woman and you want to go work, why can't you go work? Like if you were, if you're a woman and you want to go do whatever. Yeah. Why, why can't you? And she, she talks about this a lot later. We'll get yeah. into one of, uh, so Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother we're going to talk about, uh, or a little tiff she got in with him about this. And it's quite funny. There, she's got a funny quote where she's like, I'm not condemning him. I'm, I'm applauding him. <laughs> but, you know, I want that ability too. But anyways, we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, she was actually herself uh, a monogamist, uh, but, you know, she's advocating for this. So she felt that monogamy, particularly in the time when, when, you know, people were married, not so much out of love a lot of the times. It was more just, you know, that's a good match. Like, he has a good job or, you know, like, you know, these, these sorts of things. Yeah. Like, he's a 28-year-old yeah. doctor. You're a 13-year-old poor yeah. girl. The match made in. Yeah, so for her, she's most marriages were full of miseries. So men or women and men should just be able to go and do what they pleased outside of their marriage on that way. So, uh, yeah, so this was this was a major part of her presidential platform. And even today, that would be 
quite the controversial platform to run on, uh, let alone in the mid 19th century. So she wanted basically women to have the right to, you know, have children, marry, divorce and sleep with who they will whenever they wanted and all that good stuff. And so she states. I have an inalienable constitutional and natural right to love whom I may, to love as long or as short a period as I can, to change that love every day if I please. And with that right, neither you nor any law you can frame have any right to interfere. Yeah, so she she quickly mm. gains quite a following on this. And not just like you would think like, oh, among, uh, among a certain group following, but no, like she actually got, ended up being the first woman to speak in front of the House Judiciary Committee uh, in January 11th, 1871, uh, thanks to a friendship she had with con uh, Congressman Benjamin Butler from Massachusetts. He got her the platform and she spoke out and testifying in front of that body, that governing body. And she was on this case, she was actually arguing that women already had the legal right to vote, and she made a really good argument. So thanks to the 14th and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution, which, among other things, state... The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Wait, that's an amendment? Yeah. So... This was already there at the yeah, time. Yeah, this was already there. And then also, it's the it also uh, another uh, important passage. Uh, sorry. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the the United so you can States. see the argument here. It says the right okay. of citizens of the U.S. to vote shall not be denied. And then it says all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. are citizens. And so therefore women are citizens and therefore they should have the right to vote based on these two things. But this is not how the law was interpreted at the time, even though, that, I mean, it's pretty plainly. It seems pretty <laughs> yeah, it's clear. super clear, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's not how it was interpreted. So women were not citizens in that sense. <laughs> have you seen that? <laughs> that family guy sketch where they're like i think it's family guy where they're talking it's like flashes back to the um who wrote the constitution like the forefathers yeah, or yeah. whatever and it's like there's the right to bear arms yeah. and then he points at this thing on the wall and it's like two arms <laughs> of a bear like just attached to the wall and he's like i have no idea how this could be confused <laughs> yeah yeah, well, there's actually quite a bit of the uh, of the Constitution was initially interpreted one way, and it was actually Lincoln who really switched it when they started looking at the Declaration of Independence as an actual thing that was important to to like interpreting the Constitution. So before Lincoln, it really wasn't like the Declaration of Independence wasn't really like this important thing other than just sort of like this historical footnote of like you know declaring it wasn't like considered something that was that should define like the way we thought about the constitution as it was made and then lincoln and that that started to get mm. pushed more uh, and then it became like a thing where now we're going to look at the constitution slightly different based on okay the four the founding fathers were saying this thing here so we should kind of look at the constitution and stuff here and kind of interpret it a little slightly differently um so that was like a, a thing like you can uh, depending on how you look at the wording of things you can really uh, change their meaning quite a bit so but that was her argument it's a really good argument mm -hmm. uh nevertheless um they, they, they didn't really go for it but she went on she also went on talking about women the plight of women at the time in the american in the americas and looking at uh, it was basically in her view much like americans before the american revolution particularly regards with taxation without representation so she ends up giving um a speech her famous one of her more famous speeches lincoln hall speech on february 16th 1871 she states I and others of my sex find ourselves controlled by a form of government in the inauguration of which we had no voice and in whose administration we are denied the right to participate, though we are a large part of the people of this country. Was George III's rule, which he endeavored to exercise over our fathers, less clearly an assumed role than is this to which we are subjected? He exercised it over them with their consent and against their, without their consent and against their wish and will, and naturally they rebelled. Do men of the United States assume and exercise any less arbitrary rule over us than that was no not one whit the less to be sure his cabinet were few well they are many but the principle is the same in both cases the inherent elemental right to self-government is equally overridden by the assumption of power but the authority king george's parliament exercised was even more consistent than this is which they assume uh 
Ugh. But the authority King George's Parliament exercised was even more consistent than this is which they assume and exercise. His government made no pretension to emanation from the people. When our fathers launched taxation without representation is tyranny against King George, were they consistent? Certainly. Were they justified? Yes. Men fashioned a government based on their own enunciation of principles that taxation without representation is tyranny and that all just government exists by the consent of the governed. Proceeding upon these axioms, they formed a constitution declaring all persons to be citizens, that one of the rights of a citizen is the right to vote, and that no power within the nation shall either make or enforce laws interfering with the citizens' rights. And yet men deny women the first and greatest of all the rights of citizenship, the right to vote. Yeah. She felt... It's a bit weird reading that as a British man. <laughs> like, because clearly it's very American and women centric. Yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, she fails to convince the committee, but she's, she's you know, she's writing a very well-circulated paper. She's, mm. she's you know, giving these speeches to, to large crowds and everything. So she did start to draw the, uh, the uh, attention of a lot of the major key figures in the women's suffrage movement at the time so like susan b anthony she actually postponed the start of the national women's suffrage association convention just so she could go watch uh woodhull speak um and so the the problem with woodhull is she was so out there on a lot of things uh ahead of her time on a lot she was like too much like sure they wanted the right to vote but like she was taking it too far and so they had real strong reservations of sort of making her part of the official movement um but they ended up her and it was particularly like her views on sex and divorce and like mm -hmm. that sort of business and so like uh, elizabeth Cady stanton actually though she initially not not much later they like later the women's suffrage movement really hated woodhull um but so initially at least she felt that this should be overlooked in a letter she dated uh, was dated april 15th 1871 she states <laughs> If all they say is true, Mrs. Woodall is better than nine-tenths of our father's husband's sons, and women's purity amounts to little in the regeneration of the race, as long as man is vile. Now if our good men will only trouble themselves as much about the purity of their own sex as they do about ours, it will make, the, it will make one moral code for men and women. We shall have a nobler type of manhood and womanhood in another generation than the world has yet seen. When our soldiers went to fight the battles of freedom of the late war, did they stop to inquire into the ad ad antecedents of everybody by their side? The war would never have been finished if they had. Now, although I believe Mrs. Woodhull to be a grand woman, I should be glad to have her work for her own enfranchisement if she were not. I think she would become a better woman by thus working and by assuming all the rights, privileges, and amenities of an American citizen. I thought that was kind of an interesting argument because uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, is, yeah. she's sort of saying, uh, in the first place, she's saying, men if would men would be more like more pure like women so she was sort of embracing that that thing mm -hmm. but men should be more like that whereas woodhill's doing the exact opposite it's like women should be able to do what the men are doing uh so it was kind of the polar yeah. opposite there and then of course she was just like you know you know woodhill's got a good platform and whatnot so we should have her join because even though she's not you know up to our standards necessarily because this was the other thing is a lot of these women <laughs> Were, were like middle class and upper class, like and quite a lot of wealthy women on the women's suffrage movement leading it. And then you have Woodhull, who's this uneducated daughter of a con artist and herself for a con artist. So they, she was really looked down upon for that reason, too, just her, her, her class or whatever. She was she was a poor woman, you know, from a poor standing that had, you know, made something of herself. Uh, so, I don't know. Um, She's a bit too radical. Yeah, though. yeah. Um, so yeah, so she was, her star was writing the, rising though, and so she ended up creating the Equal Rights Party, which subsequently nominated her as their presidential candidate, naturally, in May of 1872, and ratified, ra ratified the nomination in June. Shocker. Yeah, I know. Uh, they did not... It'd be awkward if they nominated someone <laughs> yeah, else. Yeah, they did actually nominate for her vice president candidate was American um, Frederick Douglass, which are, have, are you familiar with Frederick Douglass at all? Yeah, didn't we do a video yeah, about him? Yeah, maybe, I don't know, at some point. Oh, maybe I did a biographics about Fred. Yeah, probably. I, I don't know if we've done it on YouTube. I've covered him, but I don't know if we ever made that one to YouTube. But yeah, he was a pretty awesome guy. If you ever read his his uh, autobiography, he is really good. Um, yeah, it's one of those ones that they make you read in school that's actually interesting, you know? Like most of them are kind of crap. Yeah, that would have been yeah, nice. Yeah, this one. I ended up reading bloody Ethan Frank. <laughs> yeah. I was going to shoot myself. Yeah, no, Fred. Did we talk about this before? Oh, no. my God. Like the books I had to read in school. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. 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 No, Fred. And I mean, it's not like there's not lots of great British yeah, books. Yeah, there's tons. I just had to read Ethan Frome. Yeah. No, Frederick Douglass, we, 
by Edith. We Wilson. got to read Frederick Douglass, and he was good. He it was a really super interesting um, autobiography of his. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised they haven't made like a really good movie about like him. But in any event, so unfortunately for them, though, when they did nominate Frederick Douglass as their vice president, he did not respond to the nomination, and he actually uh, ended up campaigning for Ulysses S. Grant instead. Um, so her hope, her hope with this party was that by by having Douglas, if he would have agreed to be her vice presidential candidate, it would unite the both the the women's suffrages and the people fighting for um, Black American rights into one group. Um, mm-hmm. So that would that would help uh, on the platform. So yeah, he ended up not responding though and campaigned for Ulysses S. Grant instead. I feel like I feel like if I was in the position, I'd at least be like, "Thanks, but no yeah. thanks." Like I'd write them a letter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something. But yeah, no, not nothing. She was a little too out there for for that. So. Um, yeah. And okay. she did know, to be clear here, she knew she had no chance of being elected, but that was not the point of any of this. This was the point to have a national platform in which to spread the ideas um, that she was she was advocating for. Um, so, yeah, her mm-hmm. her campaign, though, we're going to get now we're going to get to the uh, so the famed advocate of evolution and well as a uh, advocate for black and Chinese American rights. Clergyman Henry Ward Beecher, who his sister, most people have heard of his, his sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she's much more famous now. A lot of people today haven't heard of Henry Ward Beecher. But in his time, he was super famous across the country. Uh, he knew he was, a, he was a clergyman, minister. Um, so, and this, this, he he advocated for um, for a lot of the same sort of controversial ideas as Woodhill, obviously. But the one, the free love one, was once again the sticking point where he he hated Woodhull and he he railed against her on his platform and using his 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 platform across the nation. People listening to his sermons and stuff to that, and he likened her to the devil. And all that. And even cartoonist Thomas Nast, the famous cartoonist, uh, he got in on the action and depicted Woodhull as the devil in a Harper's Weekly uh, cartoon. And get this. So this cartoon depicts a wife of an abusive drunk. So she's being abused. And uh, in response to Satan or Woodhull, that Woodhull is depicted as Satan in this, uh, is encouraging the woman to divorce her husband because he's abusing her. And so instead, in the cartoon, the abused woman states, Get thee behind me, Mrs. Satan. I'd rather travel the hardest path of matrimony than follow in your footsteps. Yep. <laughs> so Wait, I'm uh, trying to work it out. Uh, I'd rather travel a... She's rather be abused oh, okay. and stay married <laughs> yeah, than get no, to be dark. evil and get divorced. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, and... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so in any event, so no, it's, it's, Woodhill didn't, I mean, she was criticized like this all the time, so she didn't really mind this one. What she hated, what she didn't like was Beecher's condemnation. I feel like she'd see it and be like, guys, really? Come. Yeah. yeah. This is, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, but Beecher's condemnation was different because he he wasn't in the happiest of marriages and so for reason and for reasons separate from what we're going to discuss here uh, he just didn't have a happy marriage so he long had rumors swirling around him of having many many affairs and several min- mistresses and so throughout his adult and the joke was literally to quote uh, one report Beecher preaches to seven or eight of his mistresses every Sunday evening <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. So she she naturally he, him condemning her for her advocating free love when she was in a monogamous relationship herself and just was yeah. advocating for free love and he was the out there. The hypocrisy angle again, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um so she ends up learning from so oh uh, on this on Beecher's editor and patron his his own patron Henry B- Bowen Henry Bowen's wife would later confess to Henry Bowen that she even had an affair with Beecher. Um, so he even was going to his patron who was supporting him, helping to support him. So, yeah. Uh, in another case, uh, Edna Dean Proctor actually claimed uh, she helped Beecher write a book. And uh, and she actually claimed Beecher raped her. But they did end up having like a, a relationship for like a year after that. So Beecher actually claims mm-hmm. it wasn't wasn't rape. It was just, you know. Uh, but either way, whatever, whatever going on with that one, uh, the pair continued to have the affair for a year after. And so this leads to Woodhill, who learns from Elizabeth Cady Stanton that a friend of Beecher's, Theodore Tilton, had told Elizabeth Cady Stanton that Beecher was having a long-standing affair with his wife, Elizabeth Tilton. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's like the guys who are like, yeah, let's definitely ban gay marriage. Definitely. Yeah. It's disgusting. It's terrible. It's like, yeah. Pr- pr- something's up there isn't yeah. it yeah <laughs> but then they're hanging out at the gay bars you know <laughs> it's like, exactly <laughs> it's like turns out he was having 17 gay affairs yeah <laughs> yeah like, oh. this was and so so this this actually this theodore tilton thing which we'll get into in a minute actually became a big problem for beecher later but at this time 
It wasn't yet. So Woodhull learns of this. And so she finally decides she's going to respond to Beecher. Like he's criticizing her constantly. And she's going to blow the whistle on his whole affair thing that the wider public didn't really know about. Like people who knew him knew about it. Uh, but, you know, the wider public didn't. So he's this manager, minister railing against these practices and he himself is doing it. So she goes ahead and she's going to use her paper to blow the whistle. So she explicitly states she was happy for Beecher for his sexual freedom in her report on the thing. Didn't judge him in the slightest for his affairs. But she just, you know, his whole hypocrisy in condemning her for promoting the idea uh, was was what she really irked her. So she sums up in her her expose, the Beecher Tilton scandal case published on November 2nd, 1872. I'm not charging him with immorality. I applaud his enlightened views. I am charging him with hypocrisy. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so this actually didn't work out for her because Beecher was really popular throughout the country. And so naturally, as many supporters went after her with a vengeance rather than, you know, being like, wait a minute, Beecher, really? Um, but so, yeah, so they, they ended up, yeah, this included... <laughs> This happens today, though, even in political stuff all the time. So you have a politician that people support and they might do something that's like so the opposite morally of the people who support them. And people still just be like, yeah, but, you know, he's our guy, you know, like so they still, you know, advocate. But it's true. Yeah. But people, people get locked into opinions and thoughts. Yeah. And then no matter what happens, they're like, let's just let's just stick with the guy. Like yeah. <laughs> there was that dude who bought. He was like a, a minister or whatever, one of these tavern ministers, and he bought a giant private jet. And wasn't he always preaching about, you know, <laughs> if you're tithing? <laughs> so yeah. It's like, dude, you bought a G6. Come on. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. And it's and, so I can spread the word of God. It's like, yeah. Well, yeah. You and then you can't do that in economy. <laughs> then the people on the opposite political spectrum, of course, they'll do like, say, the tiniest miswording of a sentence, and everyone will jump all over it because, you know, they're, they're on the other side. Um, so, yeah. In any event, yeah. so so Beecher's many supporters go after her with a vengeance, including Anthony Comstock, who I don't know if you've probably not heard of him, but he's the enactor of the Comstock Law, which uh, was Dude, based... I've heard of like four people in today's story. <laughs> yeah. So he was, Comstock Law was famous and one for... one of them was Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. So Comstock Law was famous for uh, the... It was basically just uh, a thing that... So you couldn't basically send any obscenity in the U.S. mail. So this included... Uh, talking about like birth control this computed like even if you were writing a letter to your wife and said something sexual like technically this was illegal um so like any obscenity you it was illegal to send it through the u.s mail was the point there so um in it ended up being the case anthony comstock got her arrested for for her basically sending out her publication speaking about sex and stuff like that at this point so on the day of voting rather than you know being around she was actually sitting in jail along with her sister tennessee mm -hmm. and her husband colonel blood uh they were just sitting in the ludlow <laughs> street jail um so while she was in jail for reasons not totally clear her name actually didn't appear on any state ballots even though it should have she was officially registered to do so but they didn't put her name on the ballots anyway uh and she received zero popular votes for her electorates however this was later proved that even though her her or she wasn't didn't appear on the ballot some people actually did write her in uh they just didn't count they just were thrown in the trash so a bit of extra voter voter fraud there um and then so uh, as for beecher he was soon the epicenter of the of the of a case with theodore tilton because theodore tilton actually sued him for alienation of affection which was uh, due to the affair with beecher had with tilton's wife and this actually ended up in a hung jury and once again beecher beecher he came out of it mostly unscathed well as tilton him tilton got excommunicated from the plymouth church for charging beecher with having an affair with his wife and alienating affections this beecher guy is like yeah. a teflon preacher yeah he was popular you know it was like a political figure basically and so you know uh, that's kind of what happens uh so it's kind of impressive like he's a dick but it's like yeah but yeah, he, he also like, actually, I like, mean, like, he did advocate for black and uh, like the black rights, Asian, Asian American rights, like the this sort of stuff. Like he did, you know, it wasn't all bad, but it's just, you know, this one area was, uh, was he, he was, a, you know. It's more just the hypocrisy of it. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Don't, don't be, don't be such a massive hypocrite. That's yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, at least if, at least if he can't say something, like don't go, you know, condemning other people for the thing that you're actually doing. Yeah, um, it's fine. Like if you believe that, yeah. great, go for it. I'm not going to judge you. I mean, yeah. maybe a little, but not much. Yeah. But when you say it's wrong, <laughs> yeah. you say, dude. Yeah, like, wait a minute. But yeah, so it was, this actually was a thing though that helped Woodhill temporarily because the media did not like that she got arrested 
for basically speaking her mind um, and whatnot. And so the this this was mounted to censorship of the media and journalists across the nation didn't didn't really care for her arrest. And so she was ended up she got released from jail and five months after that she was cleared of all charges. But the damage to her to herself was done. So the the public revelation. Uh, so thanks she you know her railing against Beecher and, and revealing his hypocrisy which a lot of people didn't like uh, she promoted a lot of taboo ideas her presidential campaign uh, which is uh, largely thought uh, or, or at least panned at the time in the media as her just trying to get attention for herself um, rather than her ideas mm-hmm. what she was actually going for was to get attention to her ideas but so yeah she did manage to make an enemy of an awful lot of people including at this point alienating the women's suffrage movement to boot and so again this was you know they didn't they didn't like her uh, and she had kind of gone too far in their opinion and so they turned on her and this this uh, Susan B. Anthony she publicly described Woodhill and her sister as lewd and indecent. And then when they wrote the, the history of the women's suffrage movement, they completely removed her, even though Woodhill was one of the major figures in the early going. Uh, they saw that she's not, Woodhill's not really in there. So, yeah, not exactly a controversial, uh, uh, yeah, in any event. It's, yeah. She and then got a bit shaft. <laughs> yeah, she did. And then Harriet Beecher Stowe you know, famed author, you know, sister of, yeah. of, of Beecher. So she obviously went against Woodhill as well. And uh, she called her an impudent witch and a vile jailbird. And then she even in her in her story, <laughs> My Wife and I, she kind of goes after her. <laughs> yeah, she goes after her in the story as well. So the little quote from that story. Uh, well, said I, why not a woman president as well as a woman queen of England? <laughs> because, said she, because, said he, look at the difference. The woman queen in England comes to it quietly. She is born to it, and there is no fuss about it. But whoever is set to be, blah, 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 but who is, whoever is set up to be president of the United States is just set up to have his character torn off from his back in shreds and to be mauled, pummeled, and covered with dirt by every filthy paper all over the country. And no woman that was not willing to be dragged through every kennel and slopped into every dirty pail of water like an old mob would ever consent to run as a candidate. Why it's an ordeal that kills a man, and what sort of brazen tramp of a woman would it be that could stand it and come oh my and come out of it without being killed? Wow, N- not much faith in her own gender there, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, continues Would it be any kind of woman that we should w- would it be any kind of woman that we should want to see at the head of our government? I tell you, it's quite another thing to be president of a democratic republic from what it is to be hereditary queen. Good for you, Papa, said Eva, clapping her hands. Why, how you go on? I never did hear such eloquence. No, Ida, set your mind at rest. You shan't be run for president of the United States. You are a great deal too good for that. Yeah, so then... That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's intense. Also, I, I think it was... Who was it Oprah who was saying like one of the things about like running for president is you can be beloved like everyone can love you like or just say 90% of the population thinks you're great yeah. after you've run for president 50% are going to hate you yeah pretty much uh, unless unless you somehow manage to run on an independent platform and actually get somewhere with that and then that yeah, could but work then you out never but, get but no you won't I mean like even even like Donald Trump like in the early 2000s he ran on the completely yeah. different platform uh, and, yep. and it didn't work out for him and then you know he picked a side and then that worked out um, for him it's one of the things I actually like about Trump the fact that he happily switched things to suit you know yeah, yeah. his political ambitions but also what you know he thought and, and stuff it's yeah like uh, it's a, a better example would be uh mike bloomberg mm-hmm. who has been republican and democrat at different times depending on kind of what he thought at the time which is you know what a novel idea yeah yeah um so as uh, she actually goes on beecher stowe in the 25th chapter she she more directly vilifies um uh, vilifies Woodhull herself. She she has a character named Miss Audacia Danger Eyes. And what's notable here is Woodhill reportedly had, she was known for her striking blue eyes. And so this was, you know, she was definitely referring to her. And she, uh, and this, this Miss Audacia Danger Eyes also happened to run a paper that advocated to quote, against Christianity, marriage, the family state, and all human laws and standing order. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Yeah, so that was also, her. Also, I feel like Miss Danger Eyes and Colonel Blood. Could, yeah. You know. Yeah, they could be involved. She somehow. definitely One should of them was not fictional. She <laughs> definitely should have taken the name Blood because that's just way cooler. But um, yeah, yeah, so noteworthy here though. It turns out 
Beecher had another sister named Isabella, and she was a huge supporter of Woodhull and uh, and was also a supporter of Woodhull's condemnation of her brother's hypocrisy concerning all the affairs he was having and whatnot. So, and this this actually led because of Isabella, Isabella's really wide. Uh, she was outspoken about her support of Woodhull. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was the rumor was started that uh, and widely reported that Woodhull had used witchcraft to bewitch Isabella, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, oh, here yeah. we go. Yeah, and then it was also speculated that Isabella and Woodhull were were lovers and all that, but there's actually no hard evidence of that. But whatever, whatever. Um, so after the election, though, this was so Woodhull she her su- suffered like her social life, like her family her family was getting continually harassed. She got booted out of her apartment, and she couldn't find anyone that would rent her a place to stay. Uh, so that was a bit of a problem, and uh, a lot of her her business dealings and stuff went down the tubes. Uh, directly after and uh, largely she was boycotted basically quite a bit and then she ends up uh, so she basically ends up losing most everything and she's fed up she's finally fed up the the women's suffrage movement won't you know they've turned their back on her so she's not even being really effective there her publications boycotted and you know all this stuff so she finally just like fine whatever um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to just move to London, and so she ends up divorcing Colonel Blood, uh, and then she takes her and her sister decide they're going to move to London after the death of Cornelius Vanderbilt in 1877. And so it actually is rumored that after his death, part of the reason they were able to do this um, after the death and not before was because William Vanderbilt uh, apparently, rumor has it, gave them some extra money so that they would just not talk about her his father, mm-hmm. like his father's private life, because the two women were quite intimately aware, and it was thought that Tennessee. He was actually a lover of Cornelius Vanderbilt as well. So it's, you know, rumored that he just gave him money and that gave him the money then to move to, to London. Um, so that's what they do. And so uh, briefly, just wanted to mention Tennessee. I, I This was already so long, so I didn't want to go too much into her life. But she was just as much of like an interesting person as her sister. So she... Uh, besides all the other stuff, which she was helping her sister do the whole time, she also ran for Congress, and she, Tennessee, also was uh, fought for women's right to serve in the military, and she was actually herself named a colonel of a, of the so-called the Colored National Guard Regiment. Um, and then uh-huh. after she moved to London, she married the Viscount of Montserrat, Sir Francis Cook. Uh, so then she, you know, happily married to him. Uh, also, he was uh, made a baronet. I guess at some point she was by Queen Victoria. So in any event, he died in 1901 and she herself died in 1923. So going back to Woodhill, though, once she went to England, she just started her lecturing tour again. That was how she made money. And uh, she was actually giving a lecture on the human body. The Temple of God was the title of this particular uh, lecture. And when she drew the eye Mm. of one John Bedolf Martin, he was a super wealthy banker. And uh, six years later, they were married, and it was their third husband. And, uh, yeah, she ended up uh, staying married to him until his death 18 years later in 1901 as well. Both sisters lost their husband in 1901. Um, but, um, yeah, she ended up serving in, like, World War One and the Red Cross and all that, even though she was quite old, which is so crazy to think because she was born in, like, you know, the early-ish 19th century, and she's all serving in in, in World yeah. War One. It's, it's, like, such a different era. You know, she's, like, living through the Civil War and all this, and then World War One seems so, so much more modern. Um, but yeah, and then about the same amount of time now to now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Oh, she also uh, briefly she went back to the U.S. in 1884 and 1892 to once again run for president. And this, well, the 1884 one was notable because it was the first time two women vied for the presidency in the U.S. And so the other woman was one Belva Ann Lockwood, and uh, she was actually also the first woman to be granted the right to practice law in the U.S. Uh, and she ran for president in 1884 and 1888. And she also, she didn't, uh, she was also pretty vilified in the media, but she wasn't really advocating for anything too controversial in her campaigns. So it's not, not to the extent, uh, but in her case, uh, similarly, the the votes for her were dumped in the wastebasket, um, and so she actually petitioned for to, for Congress to look into the matter of voter fraud because that was clearly happening, but they did not. Uh, so in the event. Um, <laughs> Yeah, on the side, so there seems to be voter fraud. Nah, yeah. we're just not going to look into that. <laughs> yeah. so, like, not a big deal. Um, so Thanks yeah. for bringing this to us atten- our attention. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So after her third husband's death, she ended up retiring to uh, Wor- <laughs> Worcestershire. I don't know. You you go ahead and tell me where that. Bread Breeden's Norton. Do you know that place? No. <laughs> nope. Uh, so she lived to the ripe old age of 88, dying in 1927, and uh, she has a great quote summing up her life's work. She states. While others prayed for the good time coming, I worked for it. Yeah. 
that's awesome that's a great one it's totally that's super good but yeah if you read go read like people should go read a lot of her writing and her transcripts of her speeches because she was a really uh really kind of an awesome person i think um but yeah so <laughs> i had a comment the other day i can't remember which channel it was on but someone says like oh i was really praying that you would cover this part of the story and we didn't and so just commented you didn't pray hard enough <laughs> 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 that's good I found myself quite amusing <laughs> yeah um so yeah that's that's the episode today if people want to go read more about woodhull they should go read her works uh they're great and uh yeah we are gonna reintroduce because we we just kind of forgot that we used to do this and then i was listening to old episodes uh, and i was like hey yeah. we used to do yeah i was like hey we used to do at the end like where we would talk like people would comment on the forum and reviews and stuff you know people would give feedback about something we said and we, that used to be like a thing at the end of the episodes and i totally forgot about that because we took like a three or four month break i think at one point and then we just forgot um so i thought we should yeah re reintroduce we that should have notes <laughs> yeah <laughs> what we actually used to do yeah um so yeah <sighs> on that note the, for the first one the so we were talking in the 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 episode with the the guy who invented pineapple pizza. Uh, so we were talking about why why, oh, did, yeah. why did he immigrate to Canada instead of the U.S.? That just seems you know weird. Like didn't most people immigrate to the U.S.? And so commenter uh, Zenton on the forum states, "I live in Canada, and my dad's immigrated from here from Denmark, and my dad's family immigrated here from Denmark in the late 1950s. In part because there was a massive advertisement campaign from the Canadian government in Europe to get people to move here. <laughs> wow." Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine just like advertising around a country? Move yeah. to Canada. <laughs> yeah. Apparently it's still kind of a thing, um, I guess. Uh, people still pushing to get people to move to Canada, which Canada is pretty great. Um, you know, it's I mean, it's cold in a lot of it, but, you know, it's it's nice. People are nice other than other than when they're behind the wheel, as we've discussed before. Um, but. Yeah, I just didn't realize countries advertise to get immigrants. It seems like such a strange notion in you yeah know, 2020 to be like because everyone seems to be shut the borders don't let them in <laughs> well but like canada has so much you know land and stuff and they could use That's like true. more people more people paying taxes and you know that sort of business and it's nice it's really nice in canada it's like beautiful yeah, so, yeah. i guess they've got to have some sort of requirements right because oh yeah yeah you must be able to go get a job and, and stuff but yeah 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 like yeah okay um i see some reviews here that's another thing we used to do <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Do you want to read some of them? Should we, should we read some reviews? Yeah. Did, did you purposefully choose the longest ones you could find? Let me try. <laughs> I just, well, I didn't want to choose the ones that just said like, uh, great show, great you know, because there's n nothing to, you know, nothing there. So I just, I just kind of randomly picked ones that were, uh, you know, actually said something, you know, gave some feedback or whatever. Did you purposefully pick all five stars or is that just how it was? No, that's just how it was. There wasn't any in the, in recent, I only, I didn't scroll back more than like a couple months worth of things but yeah they were i think they were all five stars naturally you didn't just sort by one star just to you know hate yourself no no, <laughs> no. Um. Uh, okay here we go witty ba banter for history geeks five stars by freaky fred i watch simon whistler almost every day after work on youtube well thanks fred his shows are concise and well written you can't thank me for that though <laughs> <laughs> well business plays right uh, um that one that's true but yeah. that is the least concise <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's funny <laughs> it's like if you like concise don't you know i well i think if you like business place. if you like concise probably don't read anything i wrote <laughs> you know like <laughs> <laughs> that's true as well yeah um, in fact i don't know geographics and biographies are good like 20 25 minutes long i don't know if i'm known for concise anymore well i, th I do think the information density is high so it, well it's not that's true well it's, it's not long much it's long yeah we we put in a lot we pack in pack in the facts so if youtube if the youtube show went if the youtube show went to a bar pub and grabbed a few beers pints with a friend mate i like this british to english translation for me uh then you'd get this podcast the material is true to the whistlerian form but without the sense of urgency or time restraint of the youtube shows my main compl my main complaint 
is that stories overlap heavily with the videos already out on YouTube, so it's a bit repetitive. A shopping cart, for example. The podcast can sound like a rough draft of these videos. However, the stories these two gents dig up are still interesting and new to everyone except the most dedicated Whistlerites. Humor is on point. Love the show, even if I've heard some of the stories before. The funny thing is... I'd say, yeah, that's... that's Yeah, that's fair. Go on. Uh, the, the, the funny thing, though, is it's kind of the opposite, whereas the, the video is the rough draft. <laughs> And this is the much That's more, true. this, this, is, this, fleshed this, has a, this is fleshed out a lot more. We got cut out things. Um, but yes, that is, that is totally a thing. And it's trying, tr- attempting to get away where we're just all the, like every episode will just be completely brand new here, but we just don't quite have the time yet. But soon ish, maybe I'm working on it at the moment uh, to, to get Excellent. that, to, to make that happen. Uh, it's not quite there yet, though, so people just have to. But in the end of the day, we've done like 5,000 articles and 1,500 videos. So, I mean, do, has everyone actually heard everything we've covered? Really? you got to be pretty hardcore. You would. I would be like the number one fan. So, yeah. Shall I do another one? Yes. Interesting history presented well. Five stars by non-zero. The Brain Food Shown show follows the adventures of British guy and nervous guy. <laughs> 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 why why this you don't is, strike me as nervous no when when I, and when i host videos people are always like uh, relax and I'm like i'm relaxed I, there's the camera like what do i have to be nervous about here yeah. absolutely nothing like i can edit out anything stupid or whatever like even on this podcast like i don't i don't get that at all and then it was funny because i used to wear like the sweatshirts when we were trying to push that right and then i switched to a nice oh, yeah. a nice shirt and it was funny because it was literally one day I recorded that. The next day I recorded it with a nice shirt, and everyone was just so like confident. Every it was exactly what happened. Everyone's like, you, "You're presenting is improved. You must be like practicing so much." I changed my shirt. Like it was literally the next day. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> but but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe just to impress. Maybe I should get like one of those like coaches who like how to. I don't know. I don't feel nervous, <laughs> but this is the thing people say. No, if anything, I would say that I, I don't know, I think rambling and carrying on is often that. And I would say I ramble and carry on more. But anyway, yeah. uh, as they explore interesting facts about history, British guy will sometimes get distracted. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. <laughs> With an amusing anecdote. That's possibly true. But nervous guy does his best to keep the show on topic. <laughs> The beauty of the show is its ability to turn a seemingly mundane topic and weave an entertaining narrative around it. British guy's voice is pleasant to listen to, and I (laughs) forgive his mispronunciation of foreign and sometimes non-foreign words. Nervous guy does great research and is the backbone of the show. I've spoken. The the funny thing about this is it's like kind of a compliment, but you know, it's like embedded a little bit. It's like, like a backhanded compliment. Yeah, but also kind of funny. Um, but five stars, yeah. so, you know. Um, yeah. I like it. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Five stars buys you a lot of credit with me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jared779. Ooh, what is this? Teaching on Skillshare because of you guys. Five stars. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm curious about this. I should have read these ahead of time. <laughs> Long time viewer of TIFO and the rest of Simon's lexicon of channels. Love the podcast, everything about it. Your sponsorship from Skillshare inspired me to join. Nice. And after looking through the content, I realized how worthwhile it would be to teach on the platform. I train businesses in nonverbal communication, body language, and found nothing in my field on the site. So that I should will be soon. I should hire this guy to make myself appear not nervous if he teaches nonverbal. <laughs> well, I, clearly, yeah, I'm should, doing you something. You should get him as a coach. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> or I should take his Skillshare, I guess, like if that's what he's putting on there. Dude, do it. <laughs> and this will be. An even better plug than my email course. Yeah, yeah. Not my email course, my taking of someone else's email course. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you both for everything that you do and helping me find new ways to expand my business. The first class will be up in January. That's now. Yeah. I don't know if it'll be up now because it's mid-January, but this is cool. Um, I'll be emailing you a free link to the class as another thank you. Hopefully, I can teach you guys something since you taught me so much. Well, thanks, Jared779. Yeah. I'll have to check That's that great. out. Yeah. <laughs> There's another one. Do you want me to do it or should we uh, move towards a wrap up? What do you oh, think? we'll do one Are more. Are these entertaining or I, f- I feel like... I don't know. I don't know. Do people like listening to reviews? Am I doing it? Am I doing it? What are you saying? Yeah, I think it's good. One more. Okay, cool. I'll yeah. do it. Okay. It's a Wonderful Show by T- TK Cola, maybe? Sorry. This podcast is genuinely one of the best I've listened to. I found it randomly on Pandora. Whoa. 
I Someone didn't discovered this podcast in the wild. I, I like didn't... that sign. I didn't know we were on Pandora. I don't even know what Pandora is. Really? <laughs> Do they not have it? It's it's like um, I mean, it's almost like the radio, but on online. You know, like wait, could... is this the music discovery service? Yeah, kinda. And you can they got like a free version yeah. with ads. Like it's a lot like an online radio, or you can pay and not get ads, which is the way to go. Um, yeah, but dude, yeah, I know what this is, but I had this when I was at university, like two thousand and five. Yeah, this is still a thing. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I still use Pandora. I got cool. my mixes that I work to. Yeah, exactly. What? Yeah, All right, check it out. Spotify just took over for me. You know, you yeah. say Spotify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I recognize the graphic from YouTube, which I also love. Over the past week, I have binged my way through every episode while I work, and I was never disappointed. The facts are interesting, and the tangents are truly delightful distractions from the defined course of things. That's hardcore, like a week going through like 50 episodes. Yeah. In a week? Oh my. Yeah, I didn't quite gather that. That's yeah. intense. Um, thank you. Good for you. And they, these are long. Yeah. I must say that I regret that the interviews were discontinued as I found them insightful and the guests unique. Carl Smallwood and the former employees of Sierra Games ride an insightful look into their prospective industries. Speaking of Carl Smallwood, while the YouTube algorithm is certainly mysterious in its mechanisms, subscribing today I found out most likely caused my introduction to Fact Fiend. So my thanks to the two of you, for it is easily my favorite channel on YouTube, but TIFO is a close second. I promise in any course. Thanks, I promise. I, I promise. In any course, thanks for, the, the, for your tireless effort, and I look forward to your next episode. Good journeys. Thank you, TK Cola. That was cool. Yeah. yeah. What a Carl. nice review. Yeah, Carl's great. People can go check that out. That of was course. good. Fact Fiends. Yeah. Subscribe. Yeah. 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 Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Shall we uh, move towards the exit? Yeah, it sounds good. This um, was long. This, this has been... Sorry? Go this, on. This was, you there. this was quite long. This one. Yeah, how are we doing? We're well, at least over an hour, right? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, well over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies. Uh, this has been the Brain Food Show. Do us a favor. as You know, as we discovered in this show, Skillshare is for everyone. And apparently, you're soon going to be able to learn about body language on there <laughs> as well. Um, skillshare.com forward slash brain food two months for free um anything you want to add go leave us a review for the review contest yep. anything else uh nothing nothing at the moment no well like i say this has been the brain food show thank you everybody for listening we'll be back well soon enough i suppose and uh yeah bye for now i'm, gonna, right. go. I'm gonna stop the recording yep <laughs>